I, I wanted this morning, I, I was really praying this week about the message for this morning. And uh, I, I, the, the, the term that came to me is one, and we've heard it, and it's all through the scriptures. The term, fear not, fear not. Jesus spoke to his disciples. He said, fear not, little flock. It's your father's good pleasure, pleasure to give you the kingdom. So I wanted to speak this morning a little bit about fear. And every one of us in here has experienced fear at one time or another, if you're honest, right? There's a good fear. Now, now some, things, some fear is good. It's a good fear if you're like walking through the woods and you see a bear. You ought to be afraid. And go the other direction. If I'm walking somewhere and I see a snake in the thing, I'm turning around and walking, especially if it has a rattle on the end of it. Okay. That's a good fear. That's called fight or flight. That's God had programmed that into us that if you know we're in a place and there's danger, it's like it's good to have fear and to and to leave. Okay. But there's there's some fears that are not good. And in the Bible, we're encouraged not to be afraid, to put our faith in God. And I was thinking, you know, we all hear of uh, phobias. I don't know if anybody here has a phobia. Okay, it's a fear. And a phobia is kind of like an irrational fear, but it's like a compulsive fear. We've all heard of things like claustrophobia. How many, how many know what that means? Of being afraid of closed-in places, you know. Or there's hydrophobia, which is fear of, of water, You're afraid of water. Acrophobia is fear of heights. But there's, I, I checked this out on the internet. There's like 600 phobias that they have identified, that you know, psychiatrists have identified. I got a couple. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give the name of the phobia, see if you can guess what it is, okay? Okay, we'll have a little quiz. Okay, here's one. I'm, I'm, I might have trouble pronouncing this. This is alliumphobia. How, how many people can make a guess what that is? Alliumphobia. It's a fear of garlic. Hey. <laughs> I hope you don't have that if you come to this, because <laughs> we like garlic. All right. Okay, here's a couple other ones. Now, this, this one, I'm going to try to pronounce this. Arachabuterophobia. 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 Anybody have this? I hope nobody has this and they get offended. But anybody, anybody have a guess of what that big name is? Now, it, now, I would have thought that, too, because arachnid, you would think that arachnophobia, but that's not it. There is, there is an arachnophobia. But that's not it. This is, now, now somebody in the world has this because they've identified this. A fear of peanut butter sticking to the roof of your mouth. <laughs> now, I didn't make this up. I got this out of a book. Okay, this is, all right. Here, here's one. I mean, somebody in the world is afraid of getting peanut, peanut butter stuck because they've identified it. All right. Uh, catophobia. C-H-A-E-T-O-phobia. Catophobia. Any, anybody know what that is? Guess? It's a fear of hair. <laughs> My wife gets that about every two or three months and tells me to get a haircut. <laughs> okay. Now, here's, here's one, and I just got a few more of these, honest, I promise. We're going to get in God's Word. Uh, this, is, this is a modern one. Nomophobia. Nomophobia. Anybody guess what that is? Fear of what? <laughs> fear of gnomes. Well, it's pretty, no, it's a fear of being out of mobile phone contact. <laughs> you know. If you, you know, if you have that, don't drive on Greensburg Road, okay, or, or Route 28 because you get, all right. You know, fear you can't text, okay. Uh, here's one. Colrophobia, C-O-U-L-R-O, colrophobia. Any guesses? This is a good one. It's a fear of clowns. I really think somebody invented that one so they could sue McDonald's. I, 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 <laughs> You know, Ronald McDonald, ah, okay, okay. Now, this, this next one, I think my wife thinks I have this one. It's called ergophobia. Anybody know what that is? Er- ergophobia, E-R-G-O-phobia. It's the fear of work. <laughs> 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 okay. Somebody says, yeah, that's why I wanted to be a preacher. <laughs> okay, all right. Okay, now this one is really going to be, I just, just a couple more, I promise. This one is, Hippopotamonstrosequipedeliaphobia. <laughs> fear of hippopotamus. No, not quite. I would have thought that too, but. It's the fear of long words. <laughs> I'm not making this up. Okay. You can look this up. I mean, everything on the internet is true, right? Okay. One, one more. One more. 
Well, no, two more. One more. Okay. Omphalophobia. This is a horrible, this would be a horrible one to have. Omphalophobia. Any guess what that is? It's a fear of belly buttons. I mean, my goodness, what, what a horrible thing. You know, we all have one. It's like, and finally, panophobia. Panophobia. That's a fear of everything. <laughs> There's some people that are afraid of everything. And they've identified all these things. That's kind of silliness, all right? But let's face it. Have you ever been afraid? You know, have you ever been afraid? God said, fear not. He said, fear not. In Genesis chapter 15, read with me. And forgive my silliness, but I couldn't, I couldn't resist. Okay. And verse 1. After these things. Now, when you see something where it says after these things, you need to find out what things it's after. And if you would look back in Genesis chapter 13 and 14, we read about a fellow named Abram. We all know Abram. He's the father of the faithful. His name was eventually changed to Abraham. God told Abraham to leave his land where he lived in a place called Ur of the Chaldees, which would be like Iran now, okay? God told him to leave his land, leave his family, and go to a place where he would show him, which would end up being Canaan, or what today would be Israel. And Abram did that. He was obedient, except he took his nephew Lot with him, okay? He wasn't completely obedient. And uh, they ended up having a strife between them because that mountain wasn't big enough for the both of them. Abram said, well, Lot, you choose where you want to go. And we know that Lot chose Sodom, which was not a good choice, but it looked good at the time. Uh, in chapter uh, 14, there was a, a Lot was taken captive. There was a battle, and Abram went forth with his men and, and, and uh, conquered the, the five kings that took them captive. He worshipped God with Melchizedek. He went to Melchizedek and offered... Uh, a tithe, and Melchizedek blessed him with, with uh, bread and wine and so forth, a picture of uh, worship and communion. And it brings us to chapter 15. After all this stuff, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram. It must have been that Abram was scratching his head, wondering what was going on. He said, Fear not, Abram. And listen to what God said to Abram. I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. This is the first place where that term fear not has been used in the scriptures. We're going to look at the first place and the last place, okay? He says, I'm your shield and your exceeding great reward. And Abram said, Lord, what will you give me, seeing I go childless, and the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus? Now, if you know, if you go back to when God first called Abram, he promised him that he would be the father of many nations, he promised him that the offspring that would come out of his loins would be like the sand on the seashore and the stars in the sky. But Abram said, Lord, I'm old and I don't have any kids. Now, I have this servant. His name is Eliezer. He says in verse 3, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born of my house is mine heir. Uh, Abram says, well, you know, I guess this Eliezer is going to have to carry on my, my legacy. I'll have to give it to him. And in verse 4, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be your heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. You're going to have a child. You're going to have a son. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars if you're able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord, and it counted it to him for righteousness. That verse in verse 6 of chapter 15 and verse 6 is like a foundational verse For what it means to be a believer in Jesus Christ. It's a salvational, it's a foundational verse for what it means to be saved. See, when we talk about being saved, well, you gotta be saved, you gotta be born again. What does that mean? Saved from what? When it talks about being saved, it means believing what God has said. Believing what God has said in His Word. Abram believed what God said. He said, I'm going to make you a father of many nations. Abram looked at himself. It says over in Romans that he beheld his own self, and he said, how can that be? But he believed God anyhow. He became the father of the faithful because he believed God in spite of the things that he saw. See, a lot of times when we look at the stuff around us, we might get scared. If you look around what's going on in the world today and you don't know the Lord, you ought to be scared. If you look what's happened in Washington, D.C. and Harrisburg and all the capitals of all the states and the things that's happened politically and socially in this nation, if you don't know the Lord, you ought to be afraid. 
Because things ain't getting better. They're not getting better. If you look at the injustice, and you look at the, look at the greed, and you look at all the stuff that's going on around us, it's scary if you don't know Jesus Christ. If you look at diseases and things, or everything's on the increase, cancer and everything else, and you say, Lord, how, how, you know, how am I going to... If you don't know Jesus Christ, you'll scare yourself half to death. You'll get the old panophobia there. Afraid of everything. And that's the way some folks are. That's why some people react in anger. That's why some people react in fear and in violence. Because they're afraid. And they don't know who to turn to. That's why some folks turn to drugs and alcohol. That's why some folks turn to addictions. That's why we, we become compulsive. Because we, we're afraid. We might not speak it. We might not look it. We might learn how to be tough on the outside. But deep down inside, man, people are anxious. And they think they'll find hope with a new president. They'll think they'll find hope with a new doctor. They think they'll find hope with a, a new mate. They'll think they'll find hope in a new city or with a new church or a new pastor or whatever. But the only place we can find hope is if we believe what God says. He will be our strength and our shield. I'm your shield and your exceeding great reward, Abram. Before Abram had a child, before even this promise was made, God said, I am everything you need. I'm your provider. I'm your protector. I'm the one that empowers you. Don't be afraid. When you see those, those folks living in Canaan, they probably weren't too thrilled to see Abram living on that mountain. Because he wasn't one of them. You know, there go the property value. Abram moving. This guy from Ur of the Chaldees, who's he? Taking all this land. And Abram was wealthy. He had a lot of stuff. He was probably a threat to the people living in Canaan at that time. God said, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid when you read the newspaper. Don't be afraid when you, when you get the phone call. Don't be afraid. Fear not. I'm your shield and your exceeding great reward. And verse, look at verse 7 of chapter 15. And he said unto him, I am the Lord that brought you out of Ur of the Chaldees. If you're saved here, who, who saved you? If, if Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, who brought you out of sin? You didn't work your way out. You didn't climb or claw your way out. God says, I'm the one that brought you out of Ur of the Chaldees to give you this land. If God saved you and he put you in a place, don't you think he's able to accomplish what he said he would accomplish in your life? Is he able? That's why we don't have to be afraid, because you know what? The onus is off of me. I don't have to make myself righteous. He's already done it. All I have to do is believe what God has said. He said, whosoever shall believe in the only begotten Son shall never perish. That's what he said, wasn't it? Do I have to add to that? Do I have to increase that? Do I have to pump that up? Do I have to somehow, you know, okay... Maintain that? He said, I'm the Lord that brought you out of Ur of the Chaldees to give thee this land to inherit it. And Abram said, Lord God, how shall I know I shall inherit it? And if you read the rest of this chapter, what God did, he commanded Abram to go through a covenant ceremony. And we're not going to read the whole thing. You can read it and study it out. They would take parts of animals. They would slay animals and lay them on the ground. And when two people would make a covenant, they would lay the parts of animals on the ground and walk between them like this. And that would be the seal of the covenant that they would make together. And if you read the rest of this story, when Abram did that, he cut, he cut the animals up and put them on the ground. I'm glad we don't have to do that anymore because I don't like cutting animals up. But they would put them on the ground. And, and what happened, if you read this, God made Abram kind of like go into a trance. And God himself was the only one that walked through them. They call that a unilateral covenant. That means that all the, all the stuff was on God and not on Abram. God took it upon himself to accomplish what he told Abram he would accomplish. That's why he could say, don't be afraid. See, if I think of, of, of how, how poorly I do the things God wants me to do, I start to be afraid. 
And I didn't preach that message right. I didn't play that song right. I didn't counsel that person right. I lost my temper. I blew up. I, whatever. I could, I could, a long list of stuff that would mark my failings as a believer. But you see, I, I'm thankful. I don't have to be afraid for my salvation because it's not on my performance. Now, there are things, you know, fellowship and, and encouragement. There are, you know, our relationship issue with him, uh, our holiness and so forth. That's a thing. But my salvation is based upon what he did and nothing else. We've got to get that in our heads. Because there's a whole lot of people trying to run up, that, run up the hard mountain, man. I'm going up the rough side. Jesus went up the rough side. <laughs> he went up for us. We can that's why we don't have to be afraid. That's why we don't have to be afraid of what's going on in the world. Now, that's, that's the first place that we see that term, fear not, okay? Let's look at the last place and turn all the way back. That's the first book of the Bible. Let's turn all the way back to the last book of the Bible, if that's all right. In Revelation chapter 1, okay? And we want to start with verse, well, it says, well, let's just start with verse, let's just read with verse 1 because we've got some time. It says, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto the servant John. The revelation was given not to confuse us, not to scare us, not to make us you know, uh, wonder, oh, what's happened, not to make us try to figure out who the Antichrist was. That's not why the revelation was given. The revelation was given to comfort us and to let us know what God is going to do. He's not, he, he doesn't hide his will. He shows us. It's the revelation, the apocalypse, the unveiling. We did a series of messages on the revelation called the unveiling. He said, look at uh, verse 3. Blessed is he that reads and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein for the time is at hand. Verse 4. John, this is the Apostle John, the last living apostle. All the other ones had been martyred. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace, peace unto you, and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before the throne. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and has made us kings and priests unto God and his Father, to be, him be glory and dominion forever. John was writing this from a penal colony, from a prison island. But he was able to say with faith, that God has made us kings and priests. If somebody would have looked at John in that place and said, you don't look like a king. Because when we talk about kings, we think of somebody with a throne and a crown and a palace and money and gold and silver. John was living in rags on, an, on the Isle of Patmos. He was, being, he was put there for his faith. But he knew that our sins had been washed in his own blood. You see, there's what we believe in. You can take everything else, all the different things that we hear in church. The, the main thing is this. Have you been washed in the blood of the Lamb? See, Abram believed God. It was counted to him for righteousness. If you believe that your sins are washed by the blood of Jesus, you know what? God sees you as righteous. And, and it's not like you got saved and then like, I work on this thing, you know, I have to go to class and I have to do this and be baptized and all that. The minute you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you will never be more righteous in the, in the eyes of God than, than you are at that, at that moment. And you can't make it any better and you can't take away from it. Why? Because it's not based on your performance, it's based on the blood of Christ. You can't change that. That's what John was saying right here. If he'd have looked at his circumstances, he would say, what in the world am I doing in this penal colony? For my faith. But he was able to call himself a king and a priest. It says in verse 7, look at this. Behold, he comes with clouds, and every eye shall see him. Do you believe that Jesus is coming back? I don't know why. There's some folks who don't think Jesus is coming back. Well, what? I don't know what this is about. John wasn't, he wasn't hallucinating. He didn't take some kind of drug and was seeing things. God was showing him what was to come to pass. Jesus is coming back. And when he comes back, every eye, every eye 
shall see him. They're going to see him on TV? I don't know. Every eye is going to see him. <laughs> every eye, every of all the 6.7 billion people on this planet, at this, or however many there's going to be here when he comes back, everyone's going to see him. He's not going to come back as a little baby. He's not going to come back, sneak in. It says, every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall well because of him. Even so, amen. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, says the Lord which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. Verse 9. I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. And I was in the Spirit. The Comforter was with me. I was in the Spirit. It was the Lord's day. I was worshiping God. I was praising His name. I was seeking his face. I was praying. We don't know what John was praying. We don't know what he was asking for, but he was in the spirit. He was in the presence of the Almighty. That's a place we could be today in this place. In the presence of God. In the presence of the Spirit. I didn't come here to see you all. I come here to be in the presence of God. I'm, I'm, I'm glad I see you. That's good. But, you know, I love you all, but I want to be in the presence of God. Man, if you go to church and God ain't there, you ought to go find another church. Okay. He says, And I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me the voices of a trumpet, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what you see, write in the book, and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia. And he names the seven churches. Verse 12. And I, I turned to see the voice and spake with me, and behold, uh, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. Verse 13. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks was one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paths with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white as wool and white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. You know what? I have never seen Jesus in person. I have never seen him with my eyes. But I believe if I would have seen this, and I see Jesus coming like this, you know what I would do? I would get on my face. I thank God that... He didn't show himself to me like that because I'd be scared. <laughs> See, this was the beloved disciple. If you read John's gospel, he was the one that might have been closest to Jesus. He was the only one that hung out at the cross when all the rest of them fled with the women. Say something for the women. <laughs> they, 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 they stayed there. They watched what was happening. John was with them. The rest of them were... But this Jesus that he saw, it wasn't the same Jesus that he saw go up into heaven. It, it was the same Jesus, but it wasn't the same picture. It wasn't the same. He looked different. It was the same Jesus. It was, there was only one Jesus. But he looked different. He wasn't the one that appeared to the, 12, uh, the 11 disciples after his resurrection and said, Here, fill my hands and fill, my, you know, fill the wound in my side. It wasn't, it wasn't, he looked different. See, when Jesus comes back, he's going to look a lot different than what he looked like when he left. We don't know what he looked like, by the way. All them pictures, you know, I try to wipe them out of my mind because we don't know what he looked like. But listen, his feet were like in the fine brass as if they burned in a furnace and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword and his countenance was as the sun shines in his strength. The glorious Son of God, the King of kings, and the Lord of lords. The one who is above all things. The one who created everything for his pleasure appeared to John. That same Jesus is here today. He's here today because he said we're two or more gathered. He says I inhabit the praises of my people. He's here today. The glorious Son of God is here today. And I saw him, and I fell at his feet as dead, as I would have also. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying, Fear not! See, at the very beginning, with a promise made to Abram, God had to tell him not to be afraid. And when his beloved disciple John, suffering for his testimony... The one who loved Christ. And Jesus had to lay his hand on him. 
and say, don't be afraid. Fear not, I'm the first and the last. Listen, I am he that lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. See, we don't have to be afraid because the Savior that I believe has conquered death. He decides who goes to hell and who goes to heaven. His criteria is your name written in the Lamb's book of life. That's the bottom line. That's what church is about. That's what faith is about. That's what Christ is about. That's what, listen, is, is your name written in the Lamb's book of life? Are you born again? If you are, don't be afraid. I'm he that lives and was dead. Behold, I'm alive forevermore. When those disciples saw Jesus hanging on that cross, they ran in fear. They feared for their own lives. Things They didn't understand why things didn't turn out the way they thought they were going to. And they were afraid. Jesus says, I'm alive. When he appeared to his disciples, he said the same thing. He says, oh, you have a little faith. I told you this was going to happen. Verse 19. Write the things which you have seen and the things which are and the things which shall be hereafter. He talks about the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. See, he begins to write letters. Uh, he tells John to write seven letters to these churches. And if you, if you study this out, the seven churches were located in what today is Turkey or at that time Asia Minor. But the churches are representative of churches today. Because if you look at every one of them churches, you'll find an example of that church today. Somewhere. It's also an example of different area, things of the church age, diff different ages of the church. But that's, we're not going to get into all that. Here's what I want to say. You know what? Things have not changed in 2,000 years. The same Jesus that appeared to John on the Isle of Patmos and said, don't be afraid, is the same Jesus who's here today saying, fear not. You're looking around you and see all kinds of crazy stuff happen. What do you expect? It's the world. It's the flesh. It's the devil. That's going to happen. Jesus said, I've overcome all that. I've defeated that. I got the keys. You don't have to be afraid. Turn with me to a couple passages and we're going to just close. Look, turn over to 1 John. Again, John, who wrote Revelation, wrote some letters. Look at 1 John, chapter 4. So now if you blink, you'll miss it. Okay. 1 John, chapter 4, and, and we want to start with verse... Uh, look at verse... Look, look at verse... Let's, let's start with verse 15. Whosoever... Are you a whosoever? Whosoever. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, what? God dwells where? You mean I got a piece of God in me? If you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, if you believe his word, just like Abraham said he believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness, if you believe God today, you know what? He counts that to you as righteousness. So I try to keep that, I try to remind myself of that, and I try to pound it in people's heads that God sees you. It doesn't matter what, what you did this last week. If your faith is in Christ, he sees you as righteous. Now, if you've been disobedient, he'll send the Holy Spirit to deal with you because he wants us all to, to portray Christ. He wants us all to be conformed to the image of his Son while we're alive here in this life. But... Our salvation? See, there's some folks think they, they get saved and lost like 20 times a day. What kind of salvation is that? 
says, if you believe in me, if you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwells in him and he in God. Verse 16, and we have known and believed that the love, uh, the love that God has to us, God is love. You hear that? God is love. And he that dwells in love dwells in God and God in him. Verse 17, herein is our love made perfect. If, if you want to allow the, the love of God to be uh, shed abroad in your heart, if you want to grow in faith, if you want to be the person that God wants you to be, here he says, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love. But perfect love, what? Casts out fear. That word perfect means complete. Have you experienced the complete, perfect love of our Savior, Jesus Christ? See, there's a lot of people who put their faith in Jesus, believe what the Word says, yet they're living in fear. They're saved, seen as righteous. But I think in my own life, how many times have I allowed myself to, myself to dwell under, under the heavy hand of fear when all I had to do was read God's word where he says, he's my shield and my great reward. And I'm talking about real stuff. I'm not talking about the, the you know, fear of hair, okay? I'm talking about when the doctor calls and says, it's malignant. I'm talking about when, you know, the, the, the accountant calls and says, man, you're broke. I'm talking about when, 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 when the son or daughter calls and says, I don't want that religion anymore. Uh, I'm, this, I'm, I'm, I'm going off on my own. I'm, we've all been there in one way or another. I'm talking about real life threatening events that will cause you to be afraid. I'm not talking about the silly stuff. I'm here to tell you this morning, and I've, I've been there. Personally, so I'm not, I'm not speaking this from just somebody who read it in a book. I have found out it's a whole lot easier to say the Lord is my strength and my, and my great reward than to get on, get, hide your head in a corner somewhere and say, oh, God, what am I going to do? Somebody said something to me the other day. We were talking, and, and they said, uh, we were talking about a situation that was unpleasant. You ever have them unpleasant situations? And they said, well, you don't seem to be that upset about it. And I said, well, I could be upset or not upset. It's going to be what it's going to be no matter what. <laughs> you can either say, okay, or you can say, oh. <laughs> I find if I let myself get miserable about something, it doesn't change anything. You know, complain about stuff, it doesn't change stuff. We have a choice. We can fear not, or we can, we can wallow in fear. Listen, perfect love casts out fear, and I'm closing. There's no fear in death, but perfect love casts out fear because fear has torment. How many people know what I'm talking about? Torture. When you're living in fear, you know, I, I'll, just, I'll just tell you, tell you the story here. A couple weeks ago, most of you know we have said this. My, my wife had a mammogram, and there was a spot. And they did another one, and they, and they wanted to do a biopsy. How many people have heard that word, biopsy? I, it's, it's one of, I hate that word. I mean, I thank God for it because you can find out what's going on, but I hate that word. And we were waiting for the results. How many know what that's like? See, I can remember one time when, when, when that happened. When I, 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 lived, I lived underneath the pew, I was, so, I was so wiped out. I let her down. I was like unable to stand. But this time I determined, and thank God we got a good report. Thank the Lord. But it could have been a bad report. See, Ultimately, it doesn't matter because the Lord God is my strength and my shield. Regardless, he's my power. He's my healer. He's my covering. He's the one that offered me an irretrievable covenant written in his blood. 
He said, this is the cup of the new covenant written on my blood, which is shed for the forgiveness of my sins. My sins are forgiven. I have a home in heaven. I don't know how long I'm going to be here. I love y'all. But there's going to come a time when we're going to have to say goodbye. Unless the rapture happens first. There's going to come a time and you might go before me, I might go before you. I don't know. God has not given me that, that schedule. But I want to be able to say like the Apostle Paul, whether I live or whether I die, to live is Christ, to die is gain. We don't have to be afraid. Fear not, little flock. It's your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. I want to pray this morning as we prepare to close our service. If you're afraid this morning, I'm just going to ask you to stand where you're at. If there's fear in your life this morning, if, you're, if, if, you're, if, you, if, you've, been, if you've been laboring under this fear of what the future holds, we just want to pray. Why don't you stand? Maybe take somebody's hand next to you if, if you can. I want to ask this question before you do that. How many people here right now have situations that, will co- that are causing them to, f- to be afraid right now in your life? You don't, have to tell, you don't have to say what it is. There's things going on. There's people right now who are, you're, waiting, you're waiting to hear things. I want to pray. And I want to ask you to be praying one for another to that person to the left of you and to the right of you. Father, in the name of Jesus, your word is true, it's pure, your laws are righteous, your your precepts are above anything that we could ever even imagine. Your love for us goes beyond our wildest dreams. Father, as much as we might love one another, we don't love anybody as much as you do. And you expressed your love when you sent your son to die on the cross. The expression of your love toward us is not not any place greater than that ugly cross and that bleeding Savior. Because we have a Savior who's been to hell and back. Because we have a, a mighty conquering Savior that marched into the depths of hell and led captivity captive and proclaimed the victory over death. Because we have a Savior who is seated at the right hand of God making intercession for us. At this moment, Lord, there's some of us who are facing some life-challenging issues. Father, we don't have to be afraid. Because the perfect love that you expressed on Calvary should cast out the fear that we have. And we ask you, Lord, to allow our faith to be strengthened in the name of Jesus. Fathers, we pray one for another. We don't, might not even know one another. We don't know the situations we're going through. But, Father, everybody, everybody deals with something. My prayer is that each and every person in this place, as we walk out this door, will walk out with a renewed sense of confidence, not in ourselves, but in you. That maybe, Father, we're, we have been saved and we've allowed ourselves to kind of uh, cool off and kind of... Uh, Get, get in a rut and get stale. My prayer, Lord, is that the flames would be rekindled, the flames of faith. Holy Spirit, I pray, God, that you would fill everyone in this place. Lord, Comforter, the Comforter who was sent by God. Father, I pray, God, everyone in this place would be filled with the Holy Ghost and have, be able to look uh, ahead and not be afraid, but to keep their eyes fixed on Jesus Christ, the author and finisher of our faith. Father, if there's one in here that might not know you as their Savior, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would speak to that one. Draw them with your love and kindness into the kingdom of God. Thank you, Father. We're going to close. We have a little song. We're going to close. And uh, As always, if you need prayer for anything, you know, I always go back and shake some hands. If you need prayer for anything, please come up and kind of hang out, and I'd, I'd love to pray with you. Myself, Brother Jairus is here. He's our intercessor prayer warrior and uh, my wife. And please, if you need prayer, don't leave without getting prayer, okay? But Father, we thank you for your love. And there's a song that we sing. 
It says, my hope is built on nothing less 